Well, we make a start. Uh, good evening, folks. Welcome. Um, thanks to Alan for uh, who's come back, especially from Spain, just to help us with the uh, with the sound tonight. Uh, but lovely to see Jennifer and Alan back from um, back from their holiday and um, joined online this morning on Zoom and made that funny noise. <laughs> <laughs> But but it's 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 lo lovely to see you both and uh, just yeah, just had a, a, a lovely uh, lovely holiday. Um, welcome Mark, who's uh, Mark and Jilly perhaps are joining us on on Zoom, and uh, those who are watching afterwards on YouTube, as I know that uh, people tell me that uh, uh, that you do. Um, as we've been uh, doing this term, we're going to spend some time in a in a passage in the book book of Jeremiah, and we'll take an opportunity just to reflect back for a while if we want to to do so. And then we'll finish with prayer, uh, wrapping up uh, our meeting uh, before eight o'clock. Um, just looking ahead for, for the moment, next Sunday, 3rd of July, uh, James will be leading a prayer meeting. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm away, I'm afraid, but James will be leading a prayer meeting. The Sunday evening after that, the 10th of July, will be a joint service of praise at uh, St. St. Thomas's Church. Um, so that'll be lovely. Um, the Sunday after that, 17th of July, will be a breaking of bread service. Um, I think I'm away for that too, but anyway, um, then we're going to come back to Jeremiah for a final time on the 24th of uh, July. We'll be looking at uh, his promise of a new covenant in, in, in chapter 31. And then we'll take a break over the, the, the summer holidays, uh, but we'll reconvene in September with a new series. And I mentioned last week that at the moment we're thinking of looking at some of the themes that work their way through the Bible from uh, beginning to end. But as I mentioned last week, very open to other suggestions. If there are topics or Bible books that we like to look at in, in more detail, please let me know if, if that's the case and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. I want these evening services to serve the people who come along. Um, now, if you ask for 12 weeks in the genealogies in 1 Chronicles, I'm unlikely to say yes. Um, but I'm open to, in principle, I'm open to, you know, to, to reasonable suggestions. Um, meanwhile, back, back to this evening. We'll begin, uh, begin with the reading from Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, so do, do, do turn to it and follow along. Uh, Jeremiah 29, <clears throat> and we'll read the first 14 verses. Uh, there's a heading in the NIV that says a letter to the exiles, and uh, that indeed is what this is. Jeremiah writes a letter uh, from Jerusalem to some of the people who've been sent into exile in, in Babylon. We'll say a little bit more about that uh, in, in a moment or two. So Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and Queen Mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the craftsmen, had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisah, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. 
You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's pray um, with those words in mind. Let's commit our evening to, to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather. Thank you for uh, the one in whose name we gather, for all that he's done, for all that he continues to do for us. Lord, as we bring ourselves to you, we also bring our world before you with all its struggles and pains. We commit to you the ongoing situ situation in Ukraine, asking, Lord, that even now some peaceful diplomatic resolution to the conflict would be found. We commit to you our brothers and sisters in the United States, for whom no doubt the debate about abortion will be very much front and centre at the moment. And we pray for wisdom and sensitivity for them as they engage with family members and friends and colleagues on these issues. Closer to home, Lord, we pray for those impacted by rail strikes and for those involved in solving disputes between those in this sector and other sectors where there's just such a, a sense of unrest at the moment. And on this Refugee Sunday, Lord, we continue to commit to you the, the plight of many millions around the world, even among our own congregation who are fleeing war and unrest and persecution for their faith and political views. And we ask that you'd strengthen the arms of those who would seek to support them. And so we pray for ourselves this evening, Lord, that you would speak to us through your old prophet Jeremiah, that we would hear your voice and that we'd be formed by your spirit more into the likeness of Jesus. We pray for our children in the lounge and we pray for uh, the young people meeting with James and others at uh, the home of uh, Simon and Emily that you'd have your hand on them to bring you our thanks and our praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to uh, share some slides as we've uh, done on uh, previous occasions. Um, there you go. Um, so we've been looking at the prophecy of uh, Jeremiah in our in our recent evening services under this overall heading of true faith in in troubled times. Just a, a very quick recap. Uh, we've looked at the call of Jeremiah in in chapter one and thought about what it means to receive a true call uh, from God ourselves. We've looked at his famous temple sermon in chapter seven and thought about the significance of true religion. Uh, we've looked at the passage in chapter 10, where he uh, contrasts the powerless idols with the powerful Lord, and we thought about uh, true worship. And we've seen something of how Jeremiah brought his struggles to, to the Lord in honest and desperate prayer, showing how we can do the same as Christians, acknowledging the, the painful reality of suffering, but, but being confident that suffering will not have the last word. And this evening, I want us to, to look at this passage from Jeremiah 29 that I've just read and think about true purpose. Uh, and in, in particular, as, as uh, I hope we'll see, as we look at this letter that Jeremiah sent to the people about how they were to live in exile in Babylon, that Jeremiah has much to say about how we are to live as the people of God in the world today. And as we get into this, I just want to share a few thoughts, which I know I've shared on previous occasions, uh, but which I think are also, also relevant here. So some of this, some of you uh, may have heard before. A, a few years back, uh, the Good Book Company published a book by this um, Australian guy, Stephen McAlpine, uh, called Being the Bad Guys, How to Live for Jesus in a World That Says You Shouldn't. And uh, it's a good book. Uh, McAlpine uh, captures what many of us will have sensed, which is that within a relatively short length of time, in the West at least, Christians have gone from being the good guys to being one of the guys 
to being the bad guys. And um, Christians, are, he says, are feeling the pinch of, of that. We're not just marginalized, but we are increasingly seen as the dangerously immoral ones in society because of our, because of our views. So we're seeing something of this being played out in states at the moment with the whole abortion debate. We're lacking in confidence as Christians. Often we're unsure of how to, how to witness or how best to respond, especially to issues around same sex, sexual relationships and gender, transgender and so on and so forth. And on those issues in particular, if we make a traditional Christian stand, we are seen as increasingly seen as the bad guys. So we, we can no longer expect our society to be like us or to share our values or believe what we believe, even if we ever really could. Now, it's too much of a stretch to, to say that we're facing outright persecution. We're not, not in this country, certainly not of the kind uh, that's suffered by many Christians around the world. But today's culture does seem more alien to Christianity than it, than it used to be. And those of you with long memories, I think, will, will recognize that. And maybe you sense that in the places where you find yourself uh, in the week among colleagues or with people you chat to or when you see stuff in the media or on Facebook or, or elsewhere. So what does following Jesus look like in, in this kind of context? How should we relate to the, to the culture in which we find ourselves? And as you all know, there are, there are different options that Christians have put forward over the years. We thought about some of these when we looked at the, the Connecting with Culture series. One option is uh, fortification. Just hunker down, build up our walls, protect ourselves, and wait for Jesus to come back. There you go. That's one option that, uh, that some Christians have gone for over the years. Uh, another is domination. No, 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 what we need to be doing is taking over the world for Jesus and using almost any means necessary. Um, another is accommodation. Uh, give in, in other words, blend in, uh, stay quiet, and hope that no one notices us too much. And I wonder if you recognize yourself in, in any of those. For me, it can depend on the day of the week. <laughs> um, but are any of those right? Or what are the alternatives, if, if not? Uh, what models does the Bible give? For instance, what about the model of the incarnation? Uh, becoming like Jesus, an embodied presence in the world for the world. What about the model of redemption? Being signposts to the rescuing work that God has begun in our lives which he will one day complete at the end of time what about mission being those who are caught up in god's big purposes for the world as we saw with philip this morning uh, witnessing to that purpose through our lips and, and and through our lives so is it possible for the christian faith to uh, not just to survive but to thrive in a world that's indifferent at best and hostile at, at worst what does such a faith look like and all this really is a, a bit of a long lead up to, to say that i hope that jeremiah's letter uh, will help us with questions like these in fact in recent years um a christian sociologist called james davison hunter has coined the term faithful presence to to help us think about what it means to live as Christians in the world today. And, and this, this term, faithful presence, has really caught on and uh, has commended itself to, 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 to many, many uh, Christian thinkers. So faithful presence is a way of saying that God himself is present with us, his people, who make themselves present by living faithfully in the world. Faithful presence and james davison hunter actually draws from jeremiah 29 which we just read uh, as a model for what it means for god's people to be faithfully present in the modern day babylons living in a very different culture 
from our true home and yet called on to seek the welfare of the place in which we live. So with all that in mind, and I know that's a, a bit of a bit of a big lead up, we can talk more about that afterwards if you, if you want to do so. I want to come to Jeremiah's letter itself. I want to focus on the verses that I read out, although the letter, letter goes on a bit more. Um, but I wanted to draw attention to, to three, three things. First of all, living as exiles. Now, um, as we've seen, Jeremiah brings God's word to God's people at the time of the exile to Babylon, 600 years uh, or so before Jesus. But it might be helpful just to have a rough idea of the flow of this period of time that we're talking about. So I just want to take a couple of minutes out this evening just to remind us of the historical situation. And again, we've looked at this in, in, other, in other series in the past, but just as a refresher for us. Uh, basically, boiling it down, the Babylonians ruled uh, between 612, when they took over from the Assyrians, right the way through to 539, when Persia took over from the Babylonians. So that's the, the era of, of Babylonian rule. And it wasn't long um, after they came to power in 612 that the Babylonians deported some of God's people to Babylon as exiles. So in 605, that was the first time, they took the cream of the crop, the very best of the very best. And this is the time when Daniel, and his three friends were taken off to Babylon. We've looked at the book of Daniel as a, as a church in, in, in recent, uh, recent years. And then later in 598, uh, King Jehoiakim uh, was taken to Babylon along with other key political and religious leaders, including at this time Ezekiel. So it's in 598 that Ezekiel goes off to, to Babylon. We, 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 we've had a look at Ezekiel in, in recent years uh, here in church as well. Now, at this time in 598, um, uh, Zedekiah, who we've met a few times in Jeremiah, he was placed on the throne in Jerusalem as a kind of puppet king of the Babylonians. So Nebuchadnezzar kind of installed um, Zedekiah. But the situation now was that some of the people were far away in Babylon as exiles, while others remained back in the land in, 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 in Jerusalem. And this made, immediately raised some questions that Jeremiah had to deal with in Jerusalem and Ezekiel had to deal with in Babylon, which is how long would the exiles remain in Babylon? And who did God love most? The ones who were in exile or the ones who were in Jerusalem? So those are the questions that were being asked at the time. Now, God's message to to Zedekiah through Jeremiah was perfectly clear. Babylon was under the Lord's control, and to rebel against Babylon was to rebel against God himself, which, as we've seen, that was not a popular message. And Zedekiah swung back and forth, but in the end, he was swayed by his counselors, and he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And that brings us to 586, with the fall of Jerusalem. So Zedekiah was captured. We saw this last week on our breaking of bread moment. He was um, he was he was punished. He was taken to to Babylon, where he where he died. Jerusalem at this point was all but destroyed, as was the temple and the walls. And there was a further deportation of exiles to to Babylon. This is a horrendous time, and it's about it's about this particular period that that the Book of Lamentations, the poems of Lamentations, were written. <coughs> Now, I spent some time just filling in that historical background for us so that when we come to the messages of Jeremiah, we can set them into their, into their context. For example, many of the sayings of judgment in Jeremiah were delivered in that period between 598 and the fall of Jerusalem in 586. And as we said, during this period, there was quite a lot of excitement about what was, happen what was going to happen. Many were convinced the exile would be over uh, very quickly. I mean, they were saying, look, the temple's still standing. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Do you remember they thought it guaranteed their security? The temple was still standing. God was still on the throne. Zedekiah will lead the people to victory. You know, if Graham Kendrick was around in those days, they would have sung that song, you know, into our hands he will give the ground we claim. They were that confident that God was going to look after them. And even some prophets in Israel were saying that's going to be the case. But of course, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the message 
that God had given the true prophets, Jeremiah in Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon. And each in their own place had to warn the people, first of all, that Jerusalem wasn't safe. And second, that God's future plans were with those in exile. Now, it's within this period that Jeremiah writes this letter. He writes this letter to those people who are already being sent off into Babylon, the Daniels and the Ezekiels and, and the others. And that's what Jeremiah tells us in the opening couple of verses. Let's just remind ourselves. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the craftsmen had gone into exile from Jerusalem. It was written in this time. Uh, when some of the people have been taken off, but the city is still standing. The letter is addressed to exiles. So who was responsible for, uh, for the people being in exile? Well, the passage gives us two answers. It speaks in verse 1 about all the people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. But in verse 4, God himself speaks to all those I carry into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So who did it, Nebuchadnezzar or God? And the answer is both. <laughs> the answer is both. At the, at the level of um, on-the-ground human history, people would have seen Nebuchadnezzar's army carrying it out, carrying out its orders. But at another level, the eye of the prophet saw the hand of God in these events. Now, paradoxically, that's, that's encouraging. The thought that God would send his people into exile is shocking at one level. But if we think about it, it's much better than the alternatives. One alternative is that God had simply given up on his people. He'd wiped his hands off them and he just abandoned them to their fate. He let Babylon have their way. Another alternative is that God wasn't strong enough to stand against the Babylonians and he's been defeated by them. Now, neither of those are true the truth is that god used the babylonians as his agents of judgment against his people and the key thing about that for all its uh, somberness is that it tells us the lord is in charge god isn't too weak to stop babylon defeating the nation in fact it's the mysterious path he has chosen for his people. And exile in the Old Testament, exile becomes part of a larger plan of God to purify the people and to renew his presence among them. But it's going to take some time to do that. It's not going to be a matter of weeks or months. It's going to be years, 70 years, in fact. And meanwhile, God's people must live where he's placed them in exile. Now, I've taken a while to, 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 to spell this out because their situation is, is important. And again, I, I know, as I've said a few times already over the, 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 the last few years, on several occasions in the New Testament, the New Testament applies the language of exile to us as Christians. So, notably, Peter addresses his first letter. I understand the men of the church are looking at 1 Peter 1 on Thursday night. Well, here's a little advanced preview. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, now hear, hear this language, exiles scattered throughout these provinces in what is uh, modern-day northern Turkey. So Peter is, is deliberately describing the Christians to whom he writes using this biblical language of exile. And he comes back to that language a few times in his letter. He calls them exiles, strangers in the world. And that's very much in keeping with 
how the New Testament elsewhere describes Christians. The language of exile is a way of saying that we live in this world, but we're not fully at home in this world. We're waiting for God to step in and, and restore it. It's not that we, we're waiting for God to whisk us off to another world. That's not a biblical view. No, we're waiting for the return of Jesus and for God to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. So we don't yet live in our ultimate home. But meanwhile, we serve the Lord where we are in the here and now. But it's like the New Testament says, it's like we're in exile. So the biblical links are strong enough to draw lines between the people of God then and the people of God now. And that allows us to explore the implications of Jeremiah's letter for us today. So what did Jeremiah have to say to the exiles then? And what does Jeremiah have to say to us as Christian exiles today? And that brings us to our second thought this evening, which is living with purpose. Now, the temptation for the exiles in Babylon was to think, was to believe the false prophets who were saying it will all be over soon. Don't worry, guys, we'll be going back soon. And so they still had their bags packed at the door, ready for the call to march back to Jerusalem. They're renting property rather than buying it. They're not putting their roots down. They're thinking about having kids, but think, now we'll wait till we're back in Jerusalem. They're wondering about whether to start a business, but they think, no, 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 we'll, we'll wait till we're back home. So how should God's people live when their postcode places them in Babylon? Well, there are three things I want us to spot. First of all, there's what I'm calling a purposeful presence. God calls them to establish their presence in Babylon. Look at verses five and six. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Now imagine the reaction when Jeremiah's letter is read out in Jewish camps in, in Babylon. Imagine the poor person who has to read it out. There are God's people. They're languishing in captivity. They're bemoaning their, their situation, complaining about the street crime and the school system and the moral standards of Babylon. And what does Jeremiah say? Plan for the long haul. Build for the future. Get involved in community development. Get involved in agriculture. Go about business as usual. And the very, very ordinariness of his instructions may come as a surprise. Build. There are all very specific commands. Build, settle, plant, eat, marry have sons and daughters increase in number. And um, when you look at those words, actually, it's not too difficult to hear echoes of the original mandate that was given to men and women at creation, you know, back in Genesis 1 and Genesis, Genesis 2, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the command to multiply and fill the earth and to, 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 to or putting Adam in the, in the garden to, to cultivate it. That's the kind of language that we've, that we've got here. And so here in 6th century BC Babylon is a reaffirmation of the significance of embodied material family and social life extended across generations. How are exiles to live? How are we to live as exiles in our modern day Babylon? by carrying on doing what we've been called to do as those made in the image of God. To steward God's good gifts to us in relationship with others and in a way that represents his own gracious rule over all things. 
Now, we, we could still do this largely cut off from the society around us. We could still do this in our, in our kind of Christian ghettos and enclaves, except that Jeremiah calls us to look outwards as well, because God's people are not just purposefully present in exile. God's people are purposefully productive in exile. Now have a look at what Jeremiah writes in the first half of verse 7. Also, as if all that's not enough, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now notice that little reminder there, similar to what we saw in verse 4, the city to which I have carried you into exile. So Nebuchadnezzar hasn't so much carried them off as God has sent them there. They're not captives, they're missionaries in Babylon. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city, Jeremiah tells God's people. I'm reading the NIV, but in the NIV, that phrase, peace and prosperity, translates one word in Hebrew, which is a Hebrew word that, uh, that we English people often know, which is the, the word shalom. Seek the shalom. Of the city, it's just one word in Hebrew. Um, in the ESV, I think it's translated welfare. Seek the welfare of the city. Um, it's often translated as peace, um, but shalom isn't a, a chance to put your feet up at the end of the day when the kids have gone to bed and have a, some peace and quiet. Shalom in scripture is that kind of comprehensive sense of well-being of harmony, of order, of completeness. Uh, shalom is the, the, the wholeness and the well-being that is a mark of God's blessing. And the danger for sometimes for Christians is for us to, to write off the world or try to establish our own fortresses in the world. But God doesn't tell us to seek peace in the city. He tells us to seek the shalom of the city, of the city itself, of the very place where you are in, where you live in exile. And so this, this is an active seeking of shalom. I mentioned James Davison Hunter earlier and his idea of faithful presence, which I, I, I do like. Um, some people have criticised Hunter to say it sounds too passive. And it, it does sound a little bit passive. But in Jeremiah, this is, an act, this is not just a passive existence. This is actively seeking the welfare of ancient Babylon. So we seek, as Christians, the welfare, the shalom of the places that we live through our everyday work as we're involved in doing business and manufacturing goods and providing services and teaching children and uh, building bikes for people and writing reports and designing software and mopping floors and stacking shelves and emptying bins and changing nappies in different ways contributing to the broader welfare of society. And it also means being a neighbour to those around us in our school, in our office, in our canteen, in our street, on our estate, in our town. It could involve becoming a school governor, joining a neighbourhood watch scheme, volunteering in a charity shop, getting involved in local politics. And I won't tire of reminding us that we're not followers of Jesus in part of our lives. We're followers of Jesus in the whole of our lives. We're a follower of Jesus in our home life. If we're a follower of Jesus in our married life, if we're married. We're a follower of Jesus in the nurturing of our children, and grandchildren, if we have them. And in our work life, or however else we keep ourselves busy and occupied during the week, so being a Christian isn't something that we bolt onto those activities 
or spheres of life. We're Christians in those activities and spheres of life. Those are the very way in which we express our faith as we live in society around us today. It's the same for Peter's readers in the New Testament. What are we to do as Christians? Do we abdicate from the society in which we live? Do we attack the society, the culture in which we live? Do we absorb ourselves into the society and culture in which we live? Well, Peter tells us in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, that's the language that he used at the start of the letter, and he comes back to it again now to remind us, by the way, don't forget your exiles in the world, he says to Christians. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Here's his equivalent of Jeremiah's message. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, if you know one Peter, you'll know that he then goes on to apply that principle to how Christians live in society, how Christians live in the workplace, and how Christians live in the home. The Peter himself is a kind of, for his readers, a modern day or a first century equivalent of Jeremiah, writing to exiles, telling them how they're to live in, in their Babylon. And the point is that you, you are seen to follow a different pattern where neighbours and colleagues and family members will be prompted to say, why do you behave that way? Why do you live that way? But Jeremiah has another thing to say about uh, living with purpose. And it's purposeful prayer. And this is the one thing we can all do uh, for the place in which we live. So look at the second half of verse 7. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And this is perhaps the most revolutionary action of all. Psalm 122, verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the shalom of Jerusalem. Same word. And the people would have been very used to praying for the shalom of Jerusalem. No problem praying for the peace and the prosperity of Jerusalem. But this was Babylon. Pagan, idolatrous god-defying babylon pray for babylon and yet here in the sixth <clears throat> century bc are echoes of paul's prayer uh, to pray for those in authority as paul tells us in 1 timothy 2 and jesus command to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you there's, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the Old Testament, just to be just to be clear. Nothing like it anywhere else in the Old Testament. There's, there's a book by um, uh, another guy, Rick McKinley, Faith of This Moment, Navigating a Polarized World as the People of God. This is all about, again, he uses the, the language of exile and the different options that are available to us in our relationship with Babylon. And he says, we can baptize Babylon, all that Babylon stands for, and call it good. We can adopt the cultural values of the world in, in which we live as exiles. Or he says, we can burn down Babylon, do all we can to, uh, you know, to legislate the culture to fit the values of the church. Or, he says, and this, of course, is his preferred option, we can find ways to bless and, if necessary, resist Babylon learn to be faithful in our presence in Babylon and in our witness to Babylon. Well, what we can see, I hope, is that Jeremiah urges that latter course of action, and so does Peter in the New Testament. They serve the God of Zion even while seeking the shalom of Babylon. But there's a final thing that Jeremiah has to say to his friends in exile, which is about living in hope. Living in hope. Remember that most of what we've seen in Jeremiah is, is a message of, of doom and gloom, but here's a ray of light. 
And in the chapters that follow chapter 29, 30, 31, and 32, uh, there's some wonderful promises about how God will restore his people. He'll bring them back from captivity. He'll love them with an everlasting love. And he'll make a new covenant with them. Next time we look at Jeremiah, we'll look at the new covenant passage. But we get a little inkling of that in verses 10 and 11. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed, for that's how long it's going to last, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. Of course, that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? Verse 11. It's one of those verses that's often put in a fridge magnet. Or you'll find as a, you know, in, in, in a Facebook post with a nice picture of a sunset or, you know, a fluffy lamb in a field um, somewhere. But we shouldn't forget the context in which it comes. It's spoken into a situation of suffering and exile. And the you is plural. It's not singular, it's plural. It's you people, you exiles. So it's not just God's going to be really nice to me and do me lots of good. It's a word of hope for the future of God's people as a whole. And verses 12 to 14 then go on to speak about the people seeking the Lord and finding him and the Lord bringing them back home. And that's the response that's needed to turn back to God and to seek him with all our heart. So you see, the people, ultimately, they still belong to Jerusalem. They still take their identity from Jerusalem, just as Daniel prays three times a day facing Jerusalem. That's where his heart really belongs. And one day the people will return to Jerusalem. But they don't sit back and just wait for God to bring that about. They're actively engaged in life in Babylon. And we too. Even as we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are confident that one day God will bring about the restoration of all things. And in a sense, he says to us, his people, I know the plans I have for you. So in this letter, Jeremiah offered the exiles then and exiles now three things. He offered them a fresh perspective to see their situation in the light of God's sovereignty. Yes, God had carried them into exile, but he would be with them in Babylon as much as he was in Jerusalem. And he offered them a fresh challenge to see their responsibility in the light of God's mission. God recalls them to their original mandate as his people to be a means of blessing to all nations, including enemy nations. And that's a mission that goes on even in exile. And he offered them a fresh hope to see their future in the light of God's promise. Sure, there'd be no quick fix, but it wasn't the end for them or for God's purposes for them or for God's purposes for the world through them. I'm going to pause there. Um hope that's helpful as uh, a little way into uh, this uh, this passage in Jeremiah 29 and also as a little way into thinking about our own lives as as exiles in the uh, in, in the world.